Our next speaker needs very little introduction on this campus. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine. He's a pioneer in the field of innate immunity. And I think he won a Nobel Prize or something this year. Please welcome Dr. Bruce Boitler. Well, thank you, all of you. I think you can see you have some absolutely fantastic teachers here at UT Southwestern. It's really humbling for me. And all I can do to begin is to say uh, that you've seen there are many ways to be a physician. And uh, you've seen that uh, there are people who work in all different walks of life in medicine. That's really one of the wonderful things about it. At some point, maybe about 30 years ago, I decided I could do the greatest good for the greatest number of people by working in the laboratory. But we're all fighting against a common enemy here. We're all fighting against death and suffering in humans, and that's what makes medicine so noble. This maybe isn't the cheeriest slide to begin with, but I just show it to remind you of that point and uh, to tell you what you already know, which is that we're all mortal, and uh, nonetheless, there's been an enormous amount of progress in pushing back the, uh, the age of death, at least. And this has happened largely because of work in the area that interests me most, and that is to say the struggle against infectious disease. I looked it up recently, preparing for this talk, actually, and about 58 million people die on the planet Earth every year. That struck me as a number that was way too low, and I could hardly believe it, but I found the figure again and again wherever I looked. And the explanation is that even though we're 7 billion people, and this is much less than 1% of us dying every year, the fact is that our population has undergone a huge expansion, and so we tend to be very young as a species. And that probably accounts for a lot of the instability on the planet and so on, but that's a big, long demographic story, and I won't go into it. But one thing that you can notice prominently here is that a lot of us die of infectious disease. Something like a quarter of all people who die on the planet die of infection. But it matters very much where you live and when you live if you want to know what you are likely to die of. You look at the United Kingdom and you see the actuarial statistics here. You see that it's just very rare for anybody to die before the age of 50. And that was not always so. It wasn't always so that if someone died at the age of 50, we said, what a shame, he was so young. Because if you look at the United Kingdom from some time ago, Liverpool, 1860, you see that things were really very different. Most people had died by the age of 50. And so in the space of 150 years or so, we've doubled the human lifespan approximately. And this has largely been attributable to public health measures, to immunization, to the introduction of antibiotics, fighting on that front. If you look at Mozambique today, you see the purple curve, and things aren't so different from what they were back in 1860, nor are they so different from the way they were in Neolithic or Paleolithic times. That's the measure of progress that there's been recently. There's something very special about infection, too, in terms of the impact it has on our species. If you look at infectious disease death in the developing world and compare it to death from all other causes, you see that it's completely skewed toward a young age. And that, of course, means that at least in recent times, and probably for most of the history of our species, this was the selective pressure that shaped what we became. This had the greatest impact on our species. It pushed our evolution more than anything else. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Amazingly, we've only been aware of microbes as the cause of infection for about 150 years. And yet, our battle with microbes has gone on for a billion years, most probably. And I want to talk to you about what this has done to us and what it's done to medicine, ultimately. Everybody believes that plants and animals had their last common ancestors something like a billion years ago, but we don't really know because in those times, there was limited mineralization of fossils. Fossils didn't form properly, and we just don't have all that much information, but we can just take it as an article of faith 
that we were one and the same, plants and animals, about that length of time ago. In those days, it's believed that the main defense against microbes, which existed even then, were antimicrobial peptides and what amounted to antibiotics, but it's difficult and expensive metabolically to maintain that kind of system. And so new systems for sensing infection began to develop and for signaling the presence of microbes. And this took quite a long time, and it became what we know today. The components of uh, these systems are represented in both plants and animals. We know that there are leucine-rich repeat proteins, and I'll show you some of these that detect microbes. There are special domains called tear domains and nod-like receptors that exist in both plants and animals. And the Nobel Prize of this last year was awarded primarily to Jules Hoffman and myself for discovering these leucine-rich repeat proteins that look kind of like question marks or, or horseshoes. These are called toll-like receptors, and they're what detect infection should you ever have an infection, should you encounter microbes. But you see, the amazing thing is that they're present in plants as well. Plants have the same kind of surface receptors. These receptors signal by way of a molecule called IRAC4. And you see its shape is similar to the kinase domain of this protein. And uh, that's no accident, because they're related by descent. We have something called the midosome in mammals. And this is not known to exist in plants as yet, but it may be represented. And certainly, plants have tear domains which are represented here and also attached to the midosome. And animals have this type of nucleotide binding motif protein. It's something called the inflammasome that alerts us to other kinds of infections. So things have become scrambled, but all the basic elements were there something like a billion years ago. Now what happened next? Something absolutely amazing happened during the Cambrian era. This was a time when life just exploded, and it all happened over something like 30 to 50 million years, that all of a sudden we went from unicellular organisms to very complex life forms. All of those shown here really did exist. You can even recognize their similarity to living organisms today. We know they existed because they're preserved absolutely in a pristine quality in shales like the Burgess Shale or the Cambrian Shale in Wales, which is, is where the name came from. And basically, all of the things we recognize in ourselves and in all living organisms were laid down at this time. Eyes developed, limbs developed, the digestive system developed. Everything is quite recognizable uh, to us today things that existed in that time. And so these structures were passed down to all the animals that are familiar to you today. But something really amazing happened during the late Cambrian period. A new kind of cell was born. And that cell is known to us as the lymphocyte today. You can recognize it because it has this thin, pale cytoplasm and this nice, smeary-looking nucleus. And the lymphocyte was something that didn't exist before, as far as we know. And it's represented in different organs in modern species. For example, in the jawless fishes, agnathans, lampreys, and hagfish, these cells are made in an organ called the typhlozole, which goes all along the intestinal tract. And if you look at jawed animals, uh, you find that it's represented in the thymus, or in the bone marrow, or in birds in the bursa of Fabricius. And of course, this is the bulwark of adaptive immunity. This was the fertile soil in which the adaptive immune system developed. How did that happen? Well, we don't know exactly. But what we do know is that these cells existed before there was adaptive immunity. And they even became T cell-like and B cell-like. But nobody knows today what those cells did in those ancient times. What we do know is that at some point, on two separate occasions, something happened that made for a new kind of system to recognize microbes, any kind that you might ever encounter. First, a recombinatorial system came into play in these precursor cells that could take DNA from the genome and splice it and rearrange it in millions of different ways to make a huge array of receptors. And the substrate on which that system operated was different. In one case, in the jawless vertebrates, it operated on those leucine-rich repeat proteins that I showed you earlier. And it made 
literally billions of different types of receptor. It made receptors that were soluble from B cell-like cells. It made receptors that remain attached to T-like cells. And this is the basis of adaptive immunity in those species. On the other hand, in our own ancestors, in the jawed vertebrates, a different kind of recombination substrate was used. Immunoglobulin type repeat proteins were used. And so we have antibodies and we have T cell receptors. And this anticipatory immune system is possibly the reason that we got to be so long lived as we are. Maybe it made it worthwhile to have a good central nervous system. Maybe it really was the underpinning of everything that we became. But there's another legacy of having an immune system. And this is something that you'll all encounter and that I encountered very early in medical school. Because we have immunity, we can also have autoimmunity and autoinflammatory disease. We can have diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and gout, which in my opinion are mostly products of what I would call innate autoimmunity, autoimmunity by the innate immune system. And we have classical autoimmune diseases like type 1 diabetes and systemic lupus erythematosus. And of course, there are dozens and dozens more of them. They amount to a fairly major part of human suffering. We know that there are more subtle kinds of inflammatory disease. If we talk about vascular disease, which if you remember, that was the number one cause of death, it's considered by most people now that this has elements of inflammation as well. When we get an atherosclerotic plaque, it matures and it sometimes ruptures as a result of inflammatory properties. And it's loaded with mononuclear cells and the same biochemical pathways involved in classical inflammation uh, take place in this tissue. And we know that degenerative diseases of the central nervous system tend to be the same. Here too we have micro microglia coming in to a lesion and we have destruction of neurons partly on the basis of inflammation. Now the toll-like receptor pathways are something I have studied the last 10 years. I believe they are really important to a lot of the disease that we see in medicine. I won't go over them, they're very complicated. A lot of them have been defined by pure genetic methods where we introduce mutations into mice at random and then we track them down after we find interruption of signaling from toll-like receptors. Uh, but we can begin to look at these now in a different way. Everything I showed you in the last slide, I show you again now in a three-dimensional format because structural biologists have been at work in parallel with us and we can begin to see the innate immune system working as one gigantic machine. A lot of this is fanciful. We don't know exactly how all of these molecules fit together. In some cases, like the midosome and also the signalosome, we do know how things are combined. But a lot of other things, we're just pasting them together. Nonetheless, you can imagine, within the next few years, we might have the same kind of understanding of innate immune signaling that we do of a watch, let's say or any sort of man-made device. That's the hope. And where might that lead us? Well, when I was in medical school, things were pretty crude in the way we treated inflammatory diseases. We would give steroids, or we would give drugs that would just destroy whole classes of cells, like lymphocytes. And that's very crude compared to what we might do in the future. Because when we see these sorts of pathways, I see drug targets. So do most other people in pharma. And there's reason to think that we might be able to interrupt signaling in very specific ways and really help people in ways that we can't at present. So that's uh, my message to all of you. Science is good. That's a perfectly legitimate way to practice medicine. And uh, I hope you all come here, and I hope you have a great time here. That concludes Thinking Big 2012. I hope you all will come to Southwestern and come to Thinking Big 2013. Outside is going to be a little mixer where you can talk with the speakers and ask them any question you'd like. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>